This is my channel's weekly compendium, ending Monday, January 15th, 2024. Case file number 1425, written by Bonita246, The Santa Claus Guardian. Since Christmas just passed, I was reminded of a miracle I was witness to a while back. This had to be about 15 years ago. I was about 26 years old. I had left a three-year relationship and started up another one with the man who is now my husband. I was so in love with my previous relationship and talking so much about how marriage and happiness was in the future. That relationship didn't work out. However, I was ashamed or more disappointed in the failure of the whole thing and wanted to prove to others that I made the right choice. I didn't want to ask anyone for help. I know that was dumb. Anyway, I didn't have a car, and instead of asking my mom for a ride, because my ex used to take me back and forth to work, I decided to use the city's cab service. It ended up getting really expensive, and oftentimes I barely had enough money to get back and forth to work. Sometimes I even walked, and it was a whole city away, taking about two hours to get home. Anyways, I was a manager at McDonald's, and it was stressful. One cold winter night, I was stressing badly because I didn't have enough to get home that night, and it was way too cold to walk. On a break, I decided to walk down to the busy road in the dark and smoke a cigarette and cry and think. The road is a straight one, and I could see in front and in back of me clearly, across the street as well. I got a little down the road and the Santa Claus looking dude approached me. I was totally creeped out, but remained friendly throughout the encounter. The man said hello and asked me how I was. I spoke back and told him I was okay. He said something like I shouldn't be walking in the dark, being a young lady. Then he said that I looked like I could use some money. I said, don't we all, and giggled a little. He said, I have this for you, and gave me a $50 bill. He said the only thing that he wanted in return was a hug. I was thinking, that's weird, but gave him a hug. He said Merry Christmas and went on. I immediately turned around behind him to go back to my job to check if the money was real. However, when I turned around not even a minute after he passed me, he was nowhere to be found. Not across the street or anything. It was as if he just vanished. I was beyond creeped out at this point and rushed back to the restaurant. Turns out the money was actually real. I was able to get a ride home plus some other things I needed until payday. I eventually swallowed my pride and finally worked out a deal with my parents to take me back and forth to work. I'm reminded of that night from time to time, especially when I'm low on cash and it seems like I'm in an impossible situation. I don't know what happened that night, but I'm forever grateful for that Santa looking dude. Case file number 1426, written by Mikey J777, an engineer's weird summoning. So one thing that I can point to that is truly unexplainable. I was around 30 and was using the standing meditation book, The Way of Energy. My sister, much more into spiritual things, and I have always been the engineer type, but she had a friend that once told me that my feet were spiritually black and dead, still no clue what he was talking about. One of the standing meditation things was to somehow focus on your center of mass and imagine some connection to the ground below. I figured, well, let me focus on this, and maybe my feet will not, you know, be dead. While I pictured this, I felt this thunk into the back of my neck. I can't really explain it. I didn't move, I didn't make a sound, I just felt this thunk feeling. Now here's the weird part. My dog at the time would like to sleep behind me while I was standing and meditating. When this thunk thing happened, my dog got up, went and hid behind a chair, scared by whatever just happened. She hid and looked around the side of the chair at me. I remember looking over at her, thinking what the hell just happened? I can't even start to hypothesize what went down. Bonus file written by Impenetrable Onion 88 The Perfectly Spooked Bobby me and my husband, boyfriend at the time, were living at his mom's place. They just got a new kitten, Bobby, who we now have adopted, and we were playing with him in the hallway. We had stopped playing and walked into our room. About a minute or so later, he started playing with the door. He would run down the hall and then wall kick off our door and would make a loud bang. He still wall kicks in our apartment all the time. 
I would open the door and he'd attack me and then run away. I'd then shut the door. This happened four or five times, with about a minute or more wait in between the next attack. I just shut the door and turned around, with my hand barely off the handle, when it sounded like a body was thrown into the door several times. We looked at each other like you heard that right, and I opened the door right away, and there was no one there. Bobby was nowhere to be seen, and in the split second it took me to open the door, he would have still been visible in the hallway. We then tried to replicate the sound. My husband, who's 180 pounds, couldn't get the door to make the same sound. He had to physically pick the door up and then body slam it to get it to sound somewhat similar. No idea what it was, but freaked both of us right out. Bobby didn't play with us the rest of the day. The craziest part was, after that, my husband told me that something similar happened to his mom and stepdad in the master bedroom, with the bathroom door which is one of those sliding pocket doors. I had never heard that story before we started dating. So many weird things happened at that house. I'm so glad we don't live there anymore. Case file number 1427, written by Kaim Reads Reddit. Vosh's cryptic adventure that will blow your mind. The husband and I had a dog named Vash. Vash was a neutered at the time, blue healer, who would sometimes hop out of the yard and go exploring probably because he was an unneutered dog, but I digress. So one Saturday, he escaped and we went looking for him. Most of the time when this happened, we would either find him out in the neighborhood or in the pound, or he'd come back on his own. This time, he was gone for two days. We checked the pound, he wasn't there. We checked in the house, in the closets, under the beds, etc. We even tried bribing him to come out of hiding with sandwich meat, very food-driven dog. This usually worked. But this time, he was just gone. My husband was sure he was dead somewhere because Vash never stayed away from home for more than a day. So he came home from work on Monday and started to unlock the door when he heard a jingle from the tags on their collars. So he looked around the front and backyard. No Vash. So he goes back to the front, opens the door, and boom! There's Vash! In the house! With both doors locked! We asked the neighbors if they let him in and then locked the door. They did not. Vosh died 10 years ago and it's still one of our greatest unsolved mysteries. We also aren't sure where he came from as he was discovered by a cross-country skateboarder tangled up in a fence somewhere. Case fall number 1428 written by Night Fury 620 The Prophetic Toddler So let's see, something unexplainable. When I was young, maybe three or four years old. My family lived on the second floor of a three-story apartment. I was going about my day, walking and crawling, when I started singing a song that my aunt was thinking. I started about halfway through in the exact place she was in. This surprised her a lot. Then I said it would rain. It was cloudy, so it wasn't that far-fetched of a thing to say. However, I turned to my parents and said again that it would rain, but it rained in the bathroom. My parents just shrugged it off as toddler nonsense. But later that night, at dinner, we heard the sound of heavy rain. However, it wasn't coming from outside. I yelled that it was raining in the bathroom and ran to it. My parents got up and stopped me from running, and to the great astonishment of my parents, it was raining in the bathroom. However, to my mom's great dismay, it was raining from the faucet, air vents, shower, and bathtub faucet. The deep yellow of urine was soaking the brand new bathroom decorations my mom had bought. Everything was ruined and soaked. My dad ran upstairs and went to their bathroom as the kids there had been left alone. He turned off the water from the toilet and the bathroom stopped raining. Thankfully, we were able to clean up all the urine, but we had to dump all the towels used to clean up the urine. My parents don't know how I knew, nor do I know how I knew this was going to happen. I haven't had any other experiences similar to this. It was simply unexplainable. Bonus file, written by J Show one My spine-chilling encounter in Jack the Ripper's square. So, between 2007 and 2011, I used to work for a large bank in London, just off of Broadgate. My train commute to the city from my hometown places me at Fenchurch Street Station, about a 10 to 15 minutes walk to work. Now, as an avid lover of London and the city, you will get to know various places and their stories. 
Obviously, as a young child growing up in a family from East London, Jack the Ripper always fascinated me. My chosen walk to work cut through Mitre Square. For those of you not in the know, Mitre Square was the location of the Ripper's fourth victim, Catherine Eddowes, in September of 1888. Knowing that Catherine's murder occurred on the 30th of September, I was going to mutter a little rest in peace to myself as I walked through the square that day. Now as you walk through Mitre Square, at the time, there was a small passage called, simply, Mitre Passage. It was a dark and slim alleyway, made up of two derelict buildings. They were being demolished to make way for new offices, with an atrium that would let you look straight up into the sky above. About 20 or so feet up, you could look into a window which was a walkway over the valley below. Now on this day, I'm walking through and saying my respects. As I look up, I see a young girl looking down at me from the window in the alley. She's wearing an old Victorian nightgown, and she's framed by candlelight placed on the window ledge in front of her. She's brushing her hair, and as she sees me, she smiles. Me not paying any mind at all, looks up and smiles back, continuing to walk through the passage. It's only 20 or so steps past the passage that it dawns on me that the buildings are empty. No one should be in there let alone be dressed in a Victorian garb and smiling down at me. I didn't go back, for fear of seeing something that the back of my brain told me shouldn't be there, although now I wish I had. I did occasionally walk through the passage on that way to work until I could no longer due to the new buildings. However, it still stays with me today, just wondering what I actually witnessed. Case file number 1429, written by Banathel. An entire town vanished after midnight. About 20 years ago, my friend and I were driving in the deep country after midnight. We liked to go and try to get lost. We were on a straight stretch of road that had no intersecting roads for some 50 miles, maybe more, that we'd never been on. We came into this tiny little town and stopped at a 24-hour gas station to fill up and buy drinks and snacks. It didn't even register at the time that a gas station in the middle of a podunk town would be open that late. The lady behind the counter rang us up and said, You need to be out of town before one. Freaked the frick out, my friend and I bolted and continued our trip, nervous about what she meant. We were out of town with five minutes to spare and kept going on that stretch. Another hour into our trip on the same road, we decided we were going to head back home. We turned around and went back the same way we came. We decided we were going to stop at another gas station on the edge of town, if it was open, because we were some thirsty bros. An hour goes by and nothing. Another five minutes and it's a cornfield. We thought we were just tired and misjudged the timing. We made it to the other end of that road without finding that town. It freaking vanished. We checked several maps and it was a cornfield through. We checked MapQuest, <laughs> yes, that long ago. And it was a freaking field. The next day, no crap, there were news reports of a small group of cheerleaders that went missing along the road. Totally freaking gone, no trace at all. All these years later, there's still no bodies and no evidence, and the car is just gone. There's a record of a town being there some 100 or so years ago, but there have been cornfields there ever since. We swore to take it to our grave, but I had to open up and get it out. Case file number 1430, written by Wolfsai555, The Silence That Speaks Volumes. My family owns this property that used to have a restaurant on it. By the time my parents bought it, the restaurant had long since been torn down, and the only things that remained was the foundation and the pole that the sign for the restaurant had been on. Even though it was located in a very rural area, it's not a quiet place. It was located next to one of the few highways in the area, and there was a pond behind the property where a lot of wildlife would gather. Between the cars, the bugs, the birds, and the rowdy trailer park nearby, there was constant noise, for the most part. While wandering around the property one day, I was playing near the back end of the foundation when suddenly, all the noise just stopped. No sound of cars passing by, no chirping of birds, no buzzing of bees, just silence. It wasn't until I left that particular spot that there was noise again. Apparently, I wasn't the only one who experienced this, 
My dad and my brother both told me that there was an odd period of silence at a specific spot. I found out later that the reason the restaurant was torn down was because the couple that had owned the restaurant died there. This might be wishful thinking, but maybe nature itself wanted to have a moment of silence for the lives lost in that area. Bonus file written by Firewood666 The Unexplained Flickering in Illyria's Historic Home Back in my hometown of Illyria, Ohio, after my parents got divorced, my mom lost the house because of my dad, so we moved most of our stuff into my grandpa's house and lived with him for the next two or three years. This house was the first house on the street and pretty much qualified as a historical building. My mom told me about a tree in the backyard that was really huge and old that my grandpa had cut down for some reason. My grandpa was an electrician, technician, and had a lot of computers which he fixed for people who needed help. The basement was full of electronics and wires and I'm almost certain he installed some of the lights down there himself as he built an entire section of the house. The story starts here. I was 9 or 10 years old. It was nighttime, and my older brother was upstairs. There were no adults home because my mom was at college and my grandpa was in the hospital. I was hungry and wanted to get a can of corn from the basement, like all little boys do. So I walked over to the basement stairs and turned on the lights. Nothing came on. I flickered the lights a little bit, still nothing. This happened after a family friend died and upstairs my brother and I confirmed that there were ghosts. So I didn't go upstairs after dark without my mother home. Anyways, I grabbed a flashlight and went downstairs. I pulled out a stool and stood on it underneath the shop light incandescent. I reached for the chain thinking it was off, but I was too short. Suddenly, the light turned on. I froze for a good 5 seconds before running upstairs and turning off the light going back to the living room. After that day, I stayed in the living room all night till my mom got home and put me to bed because I was too scared to go upstairs to sleep in a bed without my mom. To add insult to injury, the house had two bathrooms, one upstairs and one in the basement. But we had a good big fence in the backyard, so everything was fine. I'm sure there is a perfectly logical explanation as to why a 40 plus year old house would have the basement lights flicker, but my 10 year old brain didn't care. And I still don't. That house is haunted, and I'll never go past the living room without someone with me at night, even if my grandpa becomes healthy again. Case file number 1431, written by J. Triz The Mysterious Midnight Melee in Small Town, USA. I lived in a very small mining town in western US as a teenager. Pre-cell phones, pre-internet, pre-parents giving a crap what their kids did, ever. On several weekend nights, two of my friends and I would tell our parents that we were all going to crash at one of our houses for the night. Our parents were always fast asleep by 10pm and did not want to be disturbed and stupidly thought we'd just spend the night watching movies and playing Nintendo. The parents wouldn't even check with each other to verify where we were. So we had free reign. We would usually wait until 11 or 12 or so, then leave and drive somewhere. All of our houses had sloped driveways. We would roll the car in neutral out into the street and start it there to be sure no one would hear, kill the motor and roll in on neutral when returning. Some nights, we would drive half an hour to the next town over, a slightly bigger town than the one we lived in, to do whatever. One particular night, we grabbed takeout dinner at a small restaurant that stayed open late, then snuck into a movie theater and caught the end of a movie. Everyone knew almost everyone in these tiny towns, and the adults who were out late didn't care that the kids were out late too. After the movie, we aimlessly drove around the town for a while, listening to music, talking, there was next to nothing to do there. That night, we drove through some of the streets with houses just chilling killing time before heading home. We were a bit off the grid, but not too far. These were small streets with houses, front yards, streetlights, sidewalks, and some streets would just end and you'd have to turn around and trace your way back out. Turning a corner, we drove into some crap that I've never before seen and didn't understand. Keep in mind, it's around 2am and standing in the street are maybe 50 guys separated into two groups facing each other all armed with makeshift weapons and armor, one group advancing towards the other. 
Most are holding garbage can lids as shields. <laughs> this is pre-city provided plastic bins, so almost every house had their own metal cans with removable metal lids. Some of the guys have other makeshift shields like hubcaps, and one dude had what I thought was a washing machine door rigged up with ropes to hold it like a shield. And they all have weapons. Wooden sticks, baseball bats, mallets, long staffs. I didn't see any blades or firearms. And they all have helmets. Mining hard hats, football helmets, and some even have a medieval looking homemade metal helmet. It was cold. They were in jeans and boots and coats. We stopped, our headlights blaring upon them. It seemed like we drove up just as they were about to clash because the group that was advancing on the other all turned around and both groups just froze and stared at us wide-eyed. My friend threw the car in reverse and we noped the hell out of there. As we turned around, some of the guys started walking towards the car and none raised their weapons or ran towards us but still, we were freaked out and peeled out of there and drove the hell home. It took a few minutes before one of us finally spoke and said, What the frick was that? To this day, I have no idea what that was all about. I wonder if anyone else has ever experienced or seen anything similar or if anyone can shed light on what the hell these guys were up to. Or just have a laugh with me as I recall this experience. An actual fight? A street gang battle? A joke? A renaissance reenactment? There were so many guys and their weapons and armor were so deliberately homemade that it seemed unlikely to have been an impromptu fight. We wondered if they did it to surprise unsuspecting drivers and get a laugh out of it, but at 2am in this small town, they'd be lucky if anyone drove up their street at all. We didn't tell anyone and of course didn't tell our parents. Moved out of that town some years later and had never been back. It's been decades now, but that remains one of the most unexplainable things I've ever seen. Would love to hear others' thoughts. Bonus file written by Lee's House 90, the mysterious woman who rescued my diabetic mom. My mom is a type 1 diabetic, has been since she was 11 years of age. When me and my little brother were very young, I was about 7 and he was 5, I came into my mom's room to find she was acting extremely strangely. She looked almost drunk and wasn't really responsive. I went to pick up her insulin needles to see if she would react to that and she didn't. So I panicked and phoned my nan who told me to put the phone down and dial 999. For some reason, I was so frightened and confused I didn't. And instead sent my little brother outside to get help while I tried to get my mom to respond to me. My brother came back in crying, saying he couldn't find anyone. And then about 5 minutes later, this woman just walked into my mom's bedroom, called me by my name and my brothers. She said she knew my mom and help is coming. She was calm, soft spoken, and had a warm feeling about her. I didn't recognize this woman and neither did my brother. Shortly after, the ambulance arrived and got my mom's sugar levels back up. And when I went to find the woman, she was gone. Like literally gone. When my mom came around, I explained to her about this mysterious woman and what she looked like and my mom had absolutely no idea who she was and we never saw her again. If she didn't help us, my mom would have died eventually. Still gives me shivers now. Case file number 1432, written by Jeanne Dewberry. A dark figure vanished two meters behind me. I am a very rational person and I have been thinking of this happening since it happened. Talked to many people I know about it and they all got goosebumps when I told the story. I'm still not sure what happened. A person disappeared two meters behind me. I was sitting at night on a bench between two old cemeteries. Actually it's one, but it's separated in two parts with a passageway through. No one is buried there for a long time. It's in the middle of a big German city. People go for a run or for a walk there and I like being alone at night to not get bothered by people. So I don't think it is haunted or anything similar. The bench on which I sit is almost in the middle of the pathway and I have a clear view to both endings. The area is quite bright because there are streetlights. Not very bright, but when you sit there for an hour it's bright enough to not miss anything. So there is no place someone could hide without me noticing and there are high walls on both sides. 
On both ends, there are streets with bright streetlights. The bench is on one side of the path, the path is approximately 2-4 to four meters wide, and I am facing the northern part of the cemetery against the wall, but the path goes in front of me, so people have to walk past me. On the right side, there is an area with grass, gets relevant, with table tennis plates and some more benches, and there is a fence with bushes, no one can come or leave without using the path. So I have to pee and I always check if there is someone around so that I don't bother anyone. I checked both sides, no one was coming, so I stood up, went behind the bench I was sitting on, and walked like one meter to the wall with a tree with two stems, like a V. I double checked if someone was coming, nothing to see, nothing to hear. So I started peeing, and when I was almost finished, I saw through the two tree stems a dark person walking in the middle of the path towards me, under the not so bright streetlights. I thought okay, I must have missed him. He just appeared, but I could have missed him. When I saw him, he was already on the path, about in the middle of it. From my bench to the street, it's probably like 20 to 30 meters. Could have been a quick walker, but that means I must have seen him earlier, but okay. Happens. I could not see much, no face, no bright hands, just a black person. Could have had a dark skin color. I thought okay, I have to go through this situation. I clearly heard him walking towards me and coming closer. I finished peeing, adjusted my clothing, hearing him come closer so that he would pass me. I turned around, but purposely in the right direction. He came from the left. From the bench's view from the right, I was standing with my back to the bench behind it, so that I don't have to interact with this person. I heard him while turning around, expecting him right in front of me, and there was no one. The sound of the steps were gone. I was shocked. I took a look around, the direction he was going. No one. I thought he might have turned around, but also no one. In any direction. He couldn't have walked 30 meters in one second. Then I thought maybe I was misinterpreting the sounds and he quickly went to his right side on the grass and went to a bench there. So I took my very bright keychain flashlight and took a look around. I went to the grass area and again there was no one. I looked behind every tree and found no one, and watched both sides of the pathway. The ends on both sides are very bright, and I looked at the very possible location someone could have been hiding. There was no one. It happened a couple months ago and I'm still trying to figure it out, because I heard those steps. Bonus file written by Bartolone. The ring, the whiskey, and the emotional night I'll never forget. My dad was terminal. He was in his 60s and was at my childhood home, in bed, asleep. The day prior, he had been loaded up with morphine or something similar to let him die peacefully. I am a college kid at this stage of life and a total mess. I love my dad dearly and he was a great man. Before I went to the house, I picked up some whiskey. I didn't know how else to numb what I felt. I went into his bedroom as he lay there asleep, just me and him. I started sipping and sat there, thinking how much I love this man. I went through most of the bottle and fell asleep. Me in the chair besides him, just us two. I woke up. I had no idea how much time had passed. I looked over at my father, and he had reached out to me. I held it. He then reached for his other hand, and took a ring that he wore for years off his finger, and then brought me close to him and said, I love you and put the ring in my hand. Something he had never said. It wasn't like I didn't know, he just never directly stated it. It was what I think is called a signature ring with his full initials. Then he took his last breath. I sat there with him, with his heart not beating anymore, and cried quietly. After some time, I walked out of his bedroom to where many family and friends had gathered and said, he is gone. I always thought that he coming to consciousness after days of sleep and saying goodbye to me was extraordinary. Thank you to anyone listening to this. It was great to think and talk about this special moment in my life. My father's last moment. Case notes for file 1425. The Santa Claus Guardian. Ah yes, the classic guardian angel event. Although I will say, some real human beings do this kind of random charity work directly on the street. I can say if I ever got rich one day, myself, that's what I'd enjoy doing. 
You see a lot of it now with the Mr. Beast types. And I think that's great. But I also, it's kind of a business. You know what I mean? Sometimes being entirely anonymous, there's an appeal in that too. I might do a mix of both if I ever make it <laughs> to that level of wealth. But I've been in a similar position before. So broke, I could barely get home after work. I remember working in downtown Montreal, in a little apartment building at night as the doorman, but working inside at the desk. It's a fine job, but getting home, I had to take the subway and bus. I remember one time I didn't have enough money for that, and this was in winter. Walking home would take hours, but I did it anyway, and had no choice. I don't remember ever being more tired than that morning when I finally got home. Achy feet and freezing, oof. Those kind of stories, those kind of events in a person's life, they do build character. They aren't for nothing. Quesant Sofa, 1426, An Engineer's Journey. So by spiritually black and dead, I think it's more meant as disconnected from these unseen realms and dimensions that most would describe as spiritual realms. Whatever you want to call it, it's areas that we cannot directly test with any instrument, so it's hard to definitively quantify. But if we were able to subconsciously pick up information from this realm, to shut yourself off of it is indeed a huge handicap. You'd be spiritually cut off, dead, I guess. And when it comes down to it, maybe we can even invite entities from that realm over here. But I would advise caution in doing so, because you never know who will come over. Even though I think the odds are high that it would be a good entity, there's no guarantees, so be, be careful. Quesant for the bonus file. The perfectly spooked Bobby. The loudness level of these rogue sound events is what has me befuddled. Something is amplifying it beyond a natural state. So it's more than just sound from another universe, it's more like a small burst from multiple alternate universes combined at the same time. It's very weird. And now time for the quote of the day. It is our responsibilities, not ourselves, that we should take seriously. Peter Ustinov. And I would add to this, or amend it slightly, it's the responsibilities that we personally choose to undertake. Sometimes there's responsibilities that are thrust on you, but I don't think those are valid. I think sometimes in those cases you should still handle them with grace, but they aren't what define you. They aren't what build your character. It's the burdens that we bear ourselves, that we put on our back, or the weights we put on our own back. That Those are what actually matter, and those are what we should take seriously. It really harkens back to just honoring your word. If you agree to do something, whatever burden it might be, if you take the responsibility seriously, people will take you seriously. That's how it works. Okay, so file 1427. Vosh's cryptic adventure that will leave your mind blown. <laughs> Indeed, mind blown. There's something about our pets, dogs and cats especially, that enable transient phases. That is to say, when they aren't directly observed, they aren't necessarily where they should be. It's literally Schrodinger's cat at large. I do think some pets have souls. Some dogs, cats, you know, cows, all that stuff. But maybe some of them are placeholders. Maybe they're NPCs, so to speak. And those can be phased in and out with no issue. Maybe as even a function of how the simulation works. That is a way to frame it, I think. That would make some sense. Okay, Sotsafa, 1428. The Prophetic Toddler. We all know about future knowledge drifting out of the ether, but how it comes into our minds is not clear at all. Is it always being picked up like a signal from a, in a radio, but the decoding process isn't always easy or simple for the subconscious? I think younger minds seem more prone to accessing it or decoding it. Maybe it's because their subconscious doesn't automatically filter it out, and sometimes even adults are able to tap into it. Case notes for the bonus file. My spine-chilling encounter in Jack the Ripper's square. Ah yes, Jack the Ripper, famous lore indeed. The most chilling aspect about Jack the Ripper is he was never caught. No legitimate suspects. A figurative ghost that produced literal ghosts, one of which you almost certainly saw that day. How somber is that? And yet, I don't think she posed any threat to you at all. More of a longing. From her perspective, she probably is seeing London as it was over a century ago. And that's another thing I was thinking. If the perspective of spirits can be shifted, maybe it's even in time. Maybe their echo, their repeating pattern, they see things normally. And now time for the quote of the day. Sometimes, when we are generous in small, barely detectable ways, it can change someone else's life forever. Margaret Cho. Yes, the devil is in the details, but so is the angel. 
those small little acts that maybe a friend mentioned something that they really wanted for Christmas. And instead of getting them a generic gift card or something, maybe you just remember that one thing. And that means more than a thousand dollars to them. Well, unless they're, you know, struggling beyond belief. But in general, people appreciate when you remember very specific things about them. And then you act on those small things. Or it doesn't have to be something uh, that you remember about them, but maybe just making them a, a meal. Maybe they're sick and you come over with soup. You know, those small acts, they go so far and they amplify on themselves. The more small acts you do for someone, the more each subsequent one is valued. And it's not a conscious thing. It's just how it seems to work. But of course, it's not like in a video game where you have like reputation standing with an NPC and you just give them gifts to keep increasing it. It's not, you shouldn't think of it that way. But in effect, it kind of does work similar to that, which is kind of cool. <laughs> okay, Sotsufa, 1429. An entire town vanished after midnight. Oh, I love this glitch. But it's damn sad for those cheerleaders. I wonder what actually happened to them. There's no question the town vanished, since it's literally one straight stretch of road. It's impossible to get turned around or lost if you just traveled back and forth on it. A ghost town from a century ago. But that's beyond any stories I've read. Ghosts are barely capable of manifesting in our realm at all, let alone an entire physical town, complete with real food that you bought and ate. No way. It had to be from another universe, but then how was the lady at the counter aware that the town would slip away for you? And why exactly after one? There's some clue here that isn't making sense, because the lady knowing that the town would vanish, that is completely different, because most people in these multiverse events, they have no clue anything's going on, besides like oddities that don't quite add up, but even then, often people don't even notice those. It almost sounds like an experiment. Que sont 1430. The silence that speaks volumes. Honestly, that's just a beautiful sentiment. Even nature itself pausing to give respect to the couple that died there. I don't know if that's the cause or if it was some multiverse transition point and you were caught in limbo so all the sound just mutes out. But I'd rather go with the first one. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a bit of heartwarming faith. Que sont for the bonus file. The unexplained flickering in Illyria's historic home. Honestly, it's just safer to assume that weird oddities like this are from a haunting. It's entirely plausible that the old wiring in that house was responsible for the delayed activation and flickering, but risk-taking when there's no reward, well, there's no purpose in that. Why risk it? Just don't go back down there. As far as sneaking downstairs to get a can of corn, boy did we have different tastes as kids. I'd sneak downstairs to get cookies, literally in the cliche way on top of the fridge. <laughs> My mom actually thought that would stop me. I was a little monkey, so adorable. <laughs> now time for the poem of the day. Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there. I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glints on snow. I am the sunlight on ripened grain. I am the gentle autumn rain. When you awaken in the morning's hush, I am the swift uplifting rush of quiet birds in circled flight. I am the soft stars that shine at night. Do not stand on my grave and cry. I am not there. I did not die. Mary Elizabeth Fry. I just thought this was beautiful when I came across it the other day, and I wanted to include it here. I am not there. I did not die. That can be taken in many ways, but I think if you're religious or even just believe in the simulation or anything like that, that life persists after death, that the person, the soul that was there, is no longer there, but is still alive and functioning. I just find that beautiful. And this is a great way to say it. Do not mourn the dead because they're not really dead in the way most people think. And there's a juxtaposition there where a lot of people are religious, but they still mourn the dead, even though they believe, or at least they say they believe, that they're in a better place. So it really is a personal thing. The mourning is for yourself, for the adventures you can no longer have with that person, for the jokes and humor and banter and fine dying that you can't enjoy anymore with them. There is sorrow in that, but I think it's very comforting to know that, for them, they'll have their own adventures of a different sort. Adventures we can't even fathom. Until it's our turn. Que sont 1431. The mysterious midnight melee in small town USA. So if not for the 2am detail, I'd say this was certainly just a kind of LARPing event. I actually went to one when I was a teen. My mom brought me there. 
Just a bunch of teenagers and some adults play fighting with makeshift MacGyvered weapons. <laughs> there was a surprising amount of rules involved in terms of scoring and death and so on, where you could hit. It was every boy's dream day, pretty much. But at 2am? In such a small town? Pre-internet too, so organizing something like this doesn't seem feasible. And it wasn't a prank as you specify. The location doesn't add up for that because they could wait the whole night and maybe no, not a single car would come by. Maybe it was a normal LARPing event, but seen through time. And from the group's perspective, they were seeing this odd car pull up with its headlights on in broad daylight, wondering what they were up to. Both sides, seeing something odd. Not quite fitting given the parameters of time and place. Case notes for the bonus file. The mysterious woman who rescued my diabetic mom. So your brother did go outside for help. I could believe that this strange woman heard your brother's cries but from far away and came as fast as she could but it still took some time. But how she knew your names? Maybe it was your mother's guardian angel. A normal stranger human wouldn't know the names of these kids there and the, the mother too. And this would make sense, a guardian angel oversees all of her life and of course she'd be aware of her children's names. And she'd call for the ambulance that both of you in a young panic didn't. Which, you know, I don't blame you. I probably wouldn't have known what to do or been capable of emotionally handling it at the time at such a young age. Even as an adult, it would be stressful. And now time for the quote of the day. Mistakes are part of the dues one pays for a full life. Sophia Loren. Very true indeed. And I'm curious, what is all of yours biggest mistakes or would you say is your biggest mistake in life that you're willing to share? I think my biggest mistake was being homeless when I was young, just a teenager. For various reasons, it wasn't absolutely necessary to happen that way, but where my mind was, it kind of led to that. Now, funnily enough, being homeless developed my character a lot, so I don't even know if it's a mistake, but I do wonder where my life would be now had I not done that. I guess that's the other problem with mistakes, right? How do you know it was actually a mistake in the grand scope of your life? It's really hard to say. Okay, Sansa file 1432. A dark figure vanished two meters behind me. I've always contended that cemeteries would be places of peaceful rest. Even if there are lingering spirits behind, they wouldn't be full of anger and despair. Maybe loneliness would be the worst emotion present in most cases. But is this all there is here? A lonely spirit trying to manifest to the only living soul in the area? I could see it but it seems like a very manifested person, more than a ghost would normally be. Case notes for the bonus file. The ring, the whiskey, and the emotional night I'll never forget. This story really hit hard. Wow. Sorry for your loss. To be on your deathbed and asleep for the bulk of it, on a somber level, there is comfort in that. Morphine too, of course. Hopefully he wasn't in much pain. All you can wish for in a scenario like this is the ability to tell those you love exactly that that you love them, and giving you the ring too. There's no doubt there's a subconscious link involved here, where his own brain knew it's time to muster up every last drop of energy we have for our final gesture of love to our son, to be able to say those words that we knew were implied, but we had never said before, that I love you. And now time for the poem of the day. In the burned house, I am eating breakfast. You understand, there is no house, there is no breakfast. Yet here I am. The spoon which was melted scrapes against the bowl which was melted also. No one else is around. Where have they gone to, brother and sister? Mother and father? Off along the shore, perhaps. Their clothes are still on the hangers. Their dishes piled beside the sink, which is beside the wood stove, with its great and sooty kettle. Every detail clear. Tin cup and rippled mirror. The day is bright and songless. The lake is blue. The forest watchful. In the east, a bank of clouds rises up silently like dark bread. I can see the swirls in the oilcloth. I can see the flaws in the glass, those flares where the sun hits them. I can't see my own arms and legs or know if this is a trap or a blessing. Finding myself back here, where everything in this house has long been over. Kettle and mirror, spoon and bowl, including the body I had then, including the body I have now, as I sit at this morning table, alone and happy. Bare child's feet on the scorched floorboards, I can almost see. In my burning clothes, the thin green shorts, and grubby yellow t-shirt 
holding my cindery non-existent radiant flesh incandescent. Margaret Atwood It's a beautiful story of passing, and I think how the world goes on even though we eventually fade, or always have at this point. A simple thank you to all the poets out there that help define and ease tragedies. Like the video, subscribe, hit the bell. Kinetic Symphony signing off.